Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our human trafficking awareness webinar about what human trafficking is, signs of human trafficking, and what you can do if you spot them, and more being hosted by the Iowa Secretary of State's office and the Blue Campaign from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. My name is Ashley, and I'm the Business Services Outreach Specialist here at the Iowa Secretary of State's office. I am being joined today by Iowa Secretary of State Paul Pate, Iowa Deputy Secretary of State Christy Johnson, and our presenter Tom Ruck from the Blue Campaign. We all agree that this topic is incredibly important, and we are grateful to all of you for joining us today. This webinar is being recorded for future use, but your name and other identifying details are hidden from participants. The recording will be sent out to everyone sometime following the webinar. We have enabled the use of auto-generated closed captioning for this webinar, and the closed captioning on the webinar recording will be reviewed and corrected as needed. If you are using closed captioning for this webinar, please tell us if there is something that is said for which the closed captioning does not make sense so that we can restate it, and you will need to do so using the Q&A chat box. We will have a moderated Q&A session today to conclude the webinar, so please feel free to submit your questions in the chat box, but just make sure that it is the box labeled Q&A. Um, and we will do our best to answer as many of those questions as possible for you today. You may submit questions to Tom about the content in his presentation or to Secretary Pate about the Iowa Businesses Against Trafficking Program in Iowa or the Safe at Home Program. Thank you for joining us today to learn more about this crucial, crucial subject. And now I'm going to introduce Secretary Pate, who will deliver some brief remarks before I introduce Tom, our presenter, and then Tom will turn it over to you. Iowa Secretary of State Paul Pate has dedicated his life to public service. Now in his fourth term as Iowa's Commissioner of Elections, Secretary Pate is guided by three core principles, service, participation, and integrity. Secretary Pate worked with the Iowa legislature to enact the Safe at Home program, an initiative aimed at protecting survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, trafficking, and stalking by keeping their addresses confidential. More than 1,200 Iowans participate in Safe at Home. In January of 2022, Secretary Pate launched the Iowa Businesses Against Traf Trafficking Coalition. Over 400 businesses and organizations joined the coalition within its first, for, first month. Sorry, Today, over 800 businesses and organizations have joined and the efforts to end human trafficking in Iowa continue to grow. Finally, Paul Pate is a nationally recognized small business owner, small business leader, a father of three and grandfather of five. He and his wife, Jane, reside in Cedar Rapids. So I'll turn it over to you, Secretary Pate. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to, again, appreciate all of you for joining us. Uh, I think we can all agree human trafficking is a, a heinous violation of human rights affecting countless individuals globally including right here in Iowa. It is our collective responsibility to ensure these individuals are not forgotten and to recognize that we can play a role in combat, combating this crime. Uh, my office administers the Safe at Home program, which is an address confidentiality program that provides a substitute address to Iowans who are survivors and have been impacted by violent crimes such as sexual assault, domestic violence, stalking, and of course, human trafficking. Uh, since its inception eight years ago, we have more than 2,000 Iowans who have signed up for this program, and Safe at Home has been a, a crucial uh, tool in helping those victims. As an extension of that initiative, we started the Iowa Businesses Against Human Trafficking, known as IBAT, uh, two years ago. And unfortunately, human trafficking happens everywhere, even here in Iowa. A few years ago, I attended a lunch and learned, uh, a lunch and learn hosted by Chains Interrupted in my own hometown of Cedar Rapids. And it opened my eyes to the significant impact of this crime in our state. I knew then that I wanted to use every tool in my arsenal to help fight this atrocity. So working with groups like the Blue Campaign and many other advocates in the state, we launched uh, IBAT and we've reached now over 800 businesses and over 300,000 of their employees. We've put this army together to truly combat this situation. Today, we're pleased to partner with the Blue Campaign, a department of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, in helping you learn something and spotting the signs of human trafficking and what you can do as well. So we want to thank you again for joining us today, and we hope that you'll spread the good word. Thank you, Secretary Pate, for those remarks. Now I'm going to introduce our producer, or sorry, our presenter today, Tom. Mr. Tom Ruck currently serves as a Senior Engagement Manager for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security's Blue Campaign in Washington, D.C. He leads engagement with the private sector to raise awareness of human trafficking and emphasize each industry's unique position to recognize and report potential cases across the country. 
Mr. Ruck began his federal career at the Department of Veteran Affairs, where he served as the director of Fayetteville National Cemetery before being appointed to director of the Los Angeles National Cemetery, where he served for six years. Mr. Ruck was honored to bring to fruition the first National Cemetery Administration's Urban Initiative Columbarium Project at the Los Angeles National Cemetery in 2019. During his tenure at the Los Angeles National Cemetery, Mr. Ruck created and jointly produced with ABC7 in Los Angeles two Memorial Day television programs honoring the veterans of Southern California. Mr. Ruck is the author of Sacred Ground, a tribute to America's veterans, which reached number five on Amazon's bestsellers list and garnered five nationwide book awards. Royalties from book sales are donated directly to the Freedom Alliance Scholarship Fund for Children of Veterans. Prior to joining the VA, Mr. Ruck spent over 20 years in national account sales, marketing, and national account management within the clinical laboratory field. In these roles, he created and provided solutions to meet the needs of his clients while cultivating strategic partnerships. Mr. Ruck holds a Bachelor of Science from the University of Missouri in Columbia with a focus on business. He serves as a visiting fellow to the Freedom Alliance Foundation, is a member of the Pasadena Tournament of Roses, and is a member of the Newport Beach, California Post 291 Sons of the American Legion. In his free time, Mr. Ruck travels around the nation to advocate for veterans' causes on television and radio programs. And now I will turn it over to you, Tom, and thank you for being here with us again and for sharing your expertise with us today. And thank you to and all the attendees you. for joining. Thank you, Ashley. And um, my check's in the mail to you for that uh, wonderful introduction. Thank you very much. Hello, Iowa, and it's great to be uh, with you. I wish I was there in person, uh, but I'm stuck here in Washington, D.C., so we're just going to act like I'm there, and we're all going to have a good time. Unfortunately, we're going to talk today about human trafficking, and as uh, Secretary Pate definitely set the tone for today's uh, training, because this is a heinous crime. It's one that you don't think of constantly, but it's right there in front of you. It is the crime that is truly hidden in plain sight. As Ashley said, I'm Senior Engagement Manager here at the, the uh, Center for Countering Human Trafficking and the Blue Campaign. That's my information. If you need anything, it will be at the end again, but I suggest that you take it down so you can contact me if you need anything at all. Today, we're going to talk about the Blue Campaign itself, Human Trafficking 101, Homeland Security Investigations and the role they play within human trafficking, a great part of this uh, presentation today will be on the resources available to you for your employees and yourself and maybe even the communities that you serve, and then of course, closing. Let me talk about the mission of the Department of Homeland Security for a minute. With honor and integrity, we will safeguard the American people, our homeland, and our values. As Ashley said, I was with the Department of Veteran Affairs for many, many years. And the unwritten mission that I had was to say thank you one last time on behalf of a grateful nation for those of us who worked at our national cemeteries. But when I saw this mission statement and I got involved with the Homeland Security's uh, Center for Countering Human Trafficking, I realized what an important message and mission this is. Again, with honor and integrity, we will safeguard the American people, us, our homeland, our state, and the values, the cores at which we pass on to our family and live by. The Blue Campaign Overview. We are a national public awareness campaign. We're designed to educate the public and other industries to recognize the indicators of human trafficking and how to report. We work closely with DHS components, as you'll see in a minute, and we provide specific educational resources to victimization and vulnerable populations. We like to leverage our partnerships with the private sector to maximize national public awareness on anti-human trafficking efforts. And the educational awareness objectives consist of two foundational elements, protection and prevention. And that's where we're at right now. When we talk about the Center for Countering Human Trafficking, we're all part of DHS, but you can see there's over 16 entities, 16 agencies, if you would, involved with sex trafficking and forced labor around the country and the world. Everything from the Office of Inspector General, the U.S. Coast Guard, Science and Technology doc Doctorate, Federal Law Enforcement Training, everybody that you see here has representation at the CCHT to further combat human trafficking. Prevention real quickly. We have two outcomes there. We want to decrease victimization, and we within the vulnerable communities and we want to deter criminal activity. But on the protection side, 
We'd like to increase law enforcement's ability to identify victims and apply that victim-centered approach. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but what we're trying to say is we want to treat these victims, these people who have been horrifically detained or whatever they had happened to them by being in servitude of human trafficking, being sexual or forced labor, take a victim-centered approach. And of course, we want to increase the public and industry awareness of how to recognize and report crime. And that's sort of what we're doing here today. We think everybody can play a role. We want you to learn the key indicators. We want to raise your awareness. And we want you to talk to your community or your company about reporting suspected trafficking in the incidents. It's all about awareness. It's all about keeping your eyes open, seeing something, say something. And then I, I love this quote. We had this at the uh, a, a meeting about a, six months ago, and I like using it because it's very, very important. So let me just talk about it. In an increasingly interconnected world, it is no longer a matter of if a business will come into contact with trafficking, but when. Businesses face an economic, legal, and reputational risk if they engage in such contact. What we're basically saying is that at some point in time, you will come in contact with human trafficking. And you're going to face that economic, legal, and reputational risk if you engage in such. We're here today to sort of deter that if we can. The Blue Campaign, who do we work with? Well, you know, we work with a lot of different people. Uh, we engage organizations to collaboratively, uh, on new, uh, collaborate with new audience materials. We like to provide subject matter expertise and conduct regular distribution of materials, which we'll talk about in a little while. In the past, the Blue Campaign partners have aided in the following. We like to share our resources on social media and newsletters and blog posts. We have uh, representatives from the campaign speak at an event such as I'm doing here today. We like to develop new resources for specific industries and audiences, and we think the Blue Campaign is an excellent partner with IBAT, considering IBAT is the premier and leader in states combating human trafficking, and that's something we should all thank Secretary paid for, and of course, hosting Blue Campaign team members at trainings and conferences, which is sort of what's here. Human Trafficking 101, and this is what we're all here to learn. My apologies. We all think of human trafficking as what we see on TV. You see a white van pull up to a curb, people jumping out in black masks and black outfits. And my apologies, I didn't turn off my phone. My apologies. And you see them getting back in the van. That's the only van picture I could find. So if anybody has a new picture of a white van, would you please send it to me? But I'm also going to dispel the myths about human trafficking, if I could. Human trafficking, very simple, is a crime that involves the exploitation of a person for labor and or commercial sex through the acts of force, fraud, and coercion. Three simple words, force, fraud, and coercion. What types of human trafficking are there? Well, like I talked about, we always see sex trafficking the white van. I don't know why I keep bringing it up, so please send me a new picture. But sex trafficking basically is a commercial sex act which is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the person induced to perform such an act has not attained 18 years of age. Well, let's talk about forced labor for a minute, which is actually more prominent than sex trafficking, and that's when individuals are compelled against their will to provide work or service through use of force, fraud, and coercion. And again, we see those three words, force, fraud, and coercion, both in sex trafficking and forced labor. Human trafficking is real. There's 49, almost 50 million people currently living in modern slavery. We know that 5.1 million people are in modern slavery on any given day in the United States alone. And that's about one in every 65 people. Child sex trafficking has been reported in all 50 states. We know there's about three quarters of a million, 750,000 child predators online at every, any given time. And unlike drugs, human beings can be sold repeatedly with some victims forced into commercial sex with up to 50 clients in a single day. Think about that. These people have lost all their dignity, all their respect, and they are nothing more than a commodity to the traffickers who use them. 
And that's what makes human trafficking so heinous. We know that 28 million are globally are roughly involved in forced labor as of 2022. And when you look at it, we it's estimated about 86% of the forced labor cases occur in the private sector, folks. The most common industries are domestic work, manufacturing, construction, and agriculture. 86% of forced labor cases are in the private sector. We know about 72% of those cases are experiencing um, entered the country, if I could, on unlawful visas, the H-2A and the H-2B, according to that study. And the U.S. Department of Labor has identified 159 goods from 788 countries made by forced and child labor. The annual profit from this illicit industry is $150 billion. I want to go back to that last bullet point for a second. Hopefully, many of you are familiar with the spice called paprika. Technology is there today where the scientists at the laboratories can take paprika, analyze it, and determine where it came from. And from where it came from, they can determine if that was a forced labor form or just it was a straight business. That's how technology has changed, and we are trying to combat human trafficking around the world. I found that startling, and I'd like to talk about it at every talk I do, because it's amazing to me that you can take papri paprika in a jar and determine where it came from, and not only where it came from, but where it was growing, and was that area of grown to be a forced labor or just a standard business. I think it's amazing, but we need that type of technology to combat human trafficking. Let's talk a little bit about smuggling versus trafficking and the myths associated with both. Well, smuggling in itself is a crime against a border where trafficking is a crime against a person. We know that smuggling is transportation based, but trafficking is more exploitation. We know smuggling requires a border crossing where trafficking does not. We know smuggling is voluntary and trafficking is involuntary. And here's the good example. I'm trying to get into this wonderful country of ours, the United States of America. I pay somebody to bring me into the country. That is smuggling. It's a crime against the border. It's transportation based. It crossed from another country into America and it was voluntary. In fact, they probably paid that person to get them into the country. So how does that become trafficking? Very simple. When they get here to America, the coyote or the person who trafficked them says, by the way, that was a pretty rough crossing. I think you owe me more money. And the person says, well, I don't have any more money. Well, here's what you're going to have to do to work it off to make sure I get paid. It then becomes a crime against the person. It's definitely exploitation based. They're already here, so there's no border crossing. And they didn't volunteer to do what they have to do. That was demanded by the trafficker, force, fraud, and coercion. So who made traffic in effect? Well, they attack people of any age, any gender, any nationality, any socioeconomic group. Human trafficking vulnerability factors include economic instability and dependence, alcohol or substance abuse, and immigration status, just to mention a few. There is no single face of traffickers. They can be of any gender, age, or race. To victims, they can be, and here's where it gets scary for our, our, our kids, folks boyfriends or girlfriends or other romantic partners that they found online, community leaders or people of promise, prominence. They can be strangers with no relation to the victim. We find many times that traffickers hang out at malls and look for the kids who are hanging on or straggling because they want to be part of something. We also see that traffickers maybe hang out around uh, halfway houses or homes for a kids that don't have a home who have run away, and they promise them what they need and what they want. We also look at employees or other professionals, family members or friends, and peers or other students. We actually have case studies where family members have trafficked other family members. If you don't think human trafficking exists, wake up. It does, and it's terrible. And it's not where you just think on TV with the white fan. It's across America in places you would not even imagine. Well, where are they reaching the victims? Well, schools, popular meeting places, like I said, at the mall. Importantly, social media, online spaces, and dating apps. 
that's where they find most of the people. Like we said, they want to become the, your romantic partner and things of that nature. Sometimes even in peer-to-peer -peer groups, but group homes, detention centers, and shelters, they look for the people who are needing something that is not being gotten at that place. They want to take advantage of financial instability. They look for the homeless people. What do you need? A home, a meal? Do you need drugs? I can provide that for you. They befriend them. They become part of that family. They become dependent. Those people who are being trafficked become dependent on their traffickers. And that's how it all grows and starts. So if we look at some other myths involved around human trafficking, we talk about how victims will attempt to seek help in public. No. They're afraid to seek help in public because of threats from their trafficker. Their trafficker will do everything they can to own, manipulate that trafficked person. And again, it's a commodity. So even though they may hit or hurt one person, they're not going to do it to all, especially in the sex trafficking trade, because that person has to be able to do that deed that is needed for them to make money. You know, we also think that they're only foreign born individuals. Nah. They're United States citizens of any age, race, or nationality. And when we talk about physically restrained or held in bondage or otherwise physically abused, as we just talked about, it can be present, but cases often involve psychological and emotional forms of abuse, especially for those coming from another country. Don't talk to the police. They're bad. They're going to send you home. We'll take care of you. We are your friend. Don't do this. Don't do that. America will not accept you for this. They will arrest you for that. It's all a matter of manipulation of force, fraud, and coercion. Some other ones are that uh, the labor trafficking victims in the U.S. are non-citizens that are here illegally. Now, as we said, they come here on H-2A or H-2B visas. You know, labor trafficking only happens in illegal or underground industries. Nope. They're reported and prosecuted in a number of legitimate industries across the United States. And if a victim is consented to be in their initial smuggling situation, then it cannot be labor trafficking wrong. Neither initial consent nor payment is relevant in human trafficking cases. It all depends on force, fraud, and coercion. Some of the indicators that you need to look for, especially in the victims, you might see signs of fear or anxiety or uh, tension or submission. They're not going to be comfortable in settings with other human beings. Okay, they're usually in a group and they're going to be told to say nothing and do nothing. They may show signs of physical abuse under our confinement, but again, probably not. They will exhibit evidence of verbal threats, emotional abuse, and are being treated in a demeaning way. Always look out for that. They may show signs of malnourishment, poor hygiene, fatigue, sleep deprivation, and unusual behavior and illnesses and they'll dress inappropriate for their age or has lower quality clothing compared to others in their group. Small uh, note on that, six or seven years ago, there was a group of traffickers operating out of New York City that were sending their female um, victims up to an upstate uh, strip club in uh, New York City. They were getting on North Island Railroad in Grand Central. And at eight o'clock in the morning, they were dressed in high heels and sequin dresses and all made up. No one for the longest time thought that was, you know, wow, isn't that like strange? That doesn't make sense for eight o'clock or nine o'clock in the morning, but nobody talked about it. So when we talk about dresses inappropriate for their age or low quality clothing, just let common sense be your guide. You know what something is and what should be happening there. You know in a community setting what people will look like. You know in a baseball game, you know in a mall setting what people are going to look like. If you see something that doesn't make sense, please say something about it and move forward from there. The actions of these people, uh, they lack their freedom of movement, are constantly monitored. We notice that when people are at restaurants or at airports, one person talks for the whole group. One person has all the money. They don't respond. And if you ask a person a direct question, they'll look at their trafficker to see if it's okay to respond. They obviously avoid eye contact and interaction with others. As I said, has no control over their possessions or money and defer to somebody else to talk to them. They may not be able to provide logical details about their travel plans if asked. Very simple. Hey, where are you going? What's going on? They won't talk. They won't say a word. You know, 
part of what we do includes the Homeland Security investigations. And I can tell you that they work diligently to combat human trafficking around the United States. And they are part of the Department of Homeland Security, Homeland Security investigations. And as you can see, we have 225 offices in the United States, including uh, Cedar Rapids and Des Moines in Iowa, Sioux City on your border, and Omaha just a little bit west of the border. But all those offices are involved in human trafficking. And as you can see, it is across the United States. Internationally, we have the same thing. Obviously, Hong Kong, Mexico City, Colombia, Bogota, things of that nature. But look at some of the other cities we're in. It's amazing. But we have agents there working on forced labor and human sex trafficking. Look at these stats for a second. They assisted Homeland Security 731 victims last year. They initiated almost 1,300 cases, had 2,600 arrests, 500 convictions. And why is that so low? Because a lot of times it's pleaded out. Okay, real simple. They Customs and Border Patrol intercepted 256 shipments with a value of $6.9 million. They 135 CCHT training events with 14,000 participants. In the Blue Campaign, where I'm a part of, we conducted trainings, 194 of them, with 20,000 participants. We had 63 new partnerships, and we trained over 260,000 people on training of human trafficking. Real simple. Here's an example, and I'm just going to read through it for a minute and just think about this for a minute. So HSI in Norfolk, with the assistance from CCHT, investigated Magnolia Laundry Services for forced labor. It resulted in the conviction of four co-conspirators and $4. million in restitution ordered. The traffickers at this commercial laundry business for employees to work longer hours and poor conditions and to pay off the smuggling fees like I gave you in the example and threaten them with deportation and or physical harm to themselves or their families if they refuse to work as directed. Victim reported being forced to work 11 hour overnight shift before attending high school and they were all ages 14 to 16. It's real. One more. Houston. In a 28-year-old Houston man was sentenced to 25 years in prison for sex trafficking. A 13-year-old girl met on Snapchat and told her he wanted her to have sex for money. He posted ads of her wearing lingerie to advertise for commercial sex on the back page. And the back page is an app that a lot of people who are desiring <clears throat> sex, if I can say that, will go to try to find these illicit behaviors. The trafficker drove his victims to hotels and waited nearby until she finished engaging in that commercial sex act with the customers. The trafficker would then pick her up and take the money. He supplied her with drugs and he branded her with tattoo of his initials. Tragically, the victim passed away in 23. Are you ready for this? At the age of 18. If there's anybody out there in the Iowa hospitality industry, hotel and motel, contact me. Let's do a seminar for all your members. Restaurant Association, let's do seminars for your members. That's what IBAT is all about, getting the word out and getting this message to the people to make sure they know it's real. These are just two examples. I could go all hour with just examples if I could. Now let's talk about the resources that the Blue Campaign is supplying to members of IBAT to help combat human trafficking. Well, just to let you know, in 2023, we had 2,400 orders and we shipped over 2.7 million print materials free of charge. 2.7 million pieces of literature, including posters, identification cards, which we'll talk about, and 2,400 orders. What type of videos do we have for you? Well, on our website, which you have and you'll get again, we have youth awareness videos. We take us lady by the name of Mia and a gentleman by the name of Carter. And we send them through different scenarios and they're just about youth. We have trucking awareness videos. And by the way, Iowa uh, Transportation Department is one of the leaders in trying to combat human trafficking. In fact, I had a conversation with them about a year ago 
how they would put posters in the rest stops in Iowa. Well, the traffickers would come in and take the posters down. So then they put posters up like in this aluminum uh, material so they couldn't take it down. Traffickers would then walk in. If they saw that, they would drive away and go to another rest stop for everybody to use the bathroom. Yes, we are getting to them and they're learning this, but that's what counts. It's working. Of course, we have the general public indicators training, sort of like what we're doing today. And we have labor trafficking subject matter expert interviews, a gentleman by the name of Suleman. We have much, many, many more things such as indicator cards. These are little cards, it looks like a credit card. And uh, in the following industry, so if you're in maritime, technology, transportation, agriculture, domestic servitude, financial, working with youth, we have indicator cards, both in English and Spanish and probably other languages. Most of our materials are available in 28 to 30 different languages. We also have, look at these, how to talk to youth. That's called a toolkit. Human trafficking response guide for campus law enforcement, working with youth. What is human trafficking posters, human trafficking awareness 101. All of this is available at our website. We also have something called the CCHT Chronicle. And I'm very proud of this because it's the most open and read newsletter in the federal government. We have over 112,000 subscribers. It comes out monthly. It's called the CCHT Chronicle. Don't worry, we don't sell your information to anybody. But it's a great tool to have talks with your employees about human trafficking. It will give you information to stimulate discussion and uh, what to talk about when you're with your people. So if it's a monthly meeting, if it's quarterly meeting, if it's just something that you put up in the lunchroom to read, please take a look at this and subscribe to it. It's free. It comes out about once a month and it's called the CCHT Chronicle. And again, we have over 112,000 subscribers. That's about six months old. I bet you we're up to about 125,000 now. So anyway, that's something that you should definitely use. When we talk about spread the word, we know that anyone can join the fight against human trafficking. So here's a few ideas. Um, in your house of worship, within your local community, we want you to just host an event. Even in your own business, host an event, an educational panel, a workshop on human trafficking. If you're in an industry that has hourly employees and they can't take a half hour or an hour off, let's do it in three different segments. I recently did something for a large hospitality management firm. We did three 10-minute trainings on three different weeks and actually turned out to be about every other week. So it was you know, over two months, but we were able to accommodate the needs of that employee. We like to share information on social media, hashtag blue campaign and trafficking, share a message or sermon to encourage your community and congruence to learn more about human trafficking, identify and tee up with law enforcement. That's the biggest thing you need to do. If you are an industry owner, contact your local police jurisdiction and ask them how they want you to report human trafficking. We're going to get into that a little bit later, but that's going to be the key thing. And encourage your staff, your managers to attend training and to report things. Public Awareness of Human Trafficking on Human Trafficking Prevention Month is the Human Trafficking Prevention Day is January 11th. There are many ways to show community support and we ask that you all try to do it. Wear blue and share a photo of yourself and others wearing blue on social media and use the hashtag pound wear blue day. We post those photos around the country. And uh, last year, the Empire State Building lit up blue. This year, we're hoping to get the sphere in Las Vegas to light up blue. And we want companies just to show that they're behind uh, the blue campaign and wearing blue. Sponsor an event, a walk, a workshop, a presentation, where's a human awareness. If you belong to a church, you have youth, talk to your minister, your priest, your pastor, and say, hey, let's do something for our kids. If you are involved, let's say, in, in a different uh, volunteer group, let's talk to them. Anything at all to help bring awareness to the people of America about human trafficking is what this is all about. As I said, here's a Wear Blue Day. You can see people wearing it. Uh, 116 million impressions on Twitter last year, and um, 11,800 plus posts on Twitter and Instagram, just to show you a few things there. Reporting, I hit on it a little while, but the key is you have to know where to report. 
Some jurisdictions may not want you to report to them. They may want you to report somewhere else, but it's important that you know what to do and where to do it. In general, you're going to have to report the ages and the number of individuals involved. Physical appearances, hey, you know, uh, look like a teen, 14 to 16, wearing a blue denim shirt, uh, white sneakers, uh, and blue and green hair, uh, you know, and, and a left tattoo or something. Their travel details, if you know, them. if you know anything about their name, address, et cetera, if an ID was checked for purchases. And we're seeing a lot of that in the restaurant industry, folks. They may come in to eat at a fast food joint, uh, as they call it, or, or another type of a, a cheaper or less expensive uh, restaurant. And the servers need to be aware of what to look for. And no, it's not in every situation. And we don't want anybody to get involved. We want you to make that call. And if you see that they get in a car and they move away, or the jurisdiction um, police hasn't been there yet, try to just get as much information as you can. So that when the police come, you can give them all the information you can. We want you to follow your organizational uh, reporting protocols. If you don't have that number for your local jurisdiction, call the National Human Trafficking Hotline or the HSI tip line. And again, do not attempt at any time to confront a suspected trafficker directly or alert them to your suspicions. Probably not safe for you and definitely not safe for the people being trafficked. How can you contact us? There we go. But let me just go to the one I like. <laughs> Take away my picture and it's a great slide. Um, just Thomas Ruck at hsi.dhs.gov. It's, um, it's what matters. And we're here to help you. So I'm now going to open it up if I can figure out how to get out of this uh, program here and uh, see if we can open this up to questions and answers. Yep. Great. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, that was really good information. Obviously, unfortunate um, that we have to have these conversations, but incredibly important. So thank you again for sharing. Um, as a reminder to everyone, you may ask questions to either Tom or to Secretary Pate, and our team will do our best to answer as many of those as possible. And please do that using the Q&A chat box. I'm also going to put the resources that Tom mentioned in the webinar chat so that you can all access those as well. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, this one looks like it's addressed to Secretary Pate. Have any Iowa businesses spotted the signs and acted since the IBAT program was created? Yes, they have. Uh, and a, a lot of these stories are, are um, of, of a business who has put the information out there uh, so that these victims can come forward and ask for help. Uh, but we also know that uh, we're pushing these bad actors out of our communities, and that's a beginning, but it's not the, the final solution because we, we want to stop it. Uh, that's the, the real message here. But when you're talking about 300,000 employees who represent the members of Joint IBAT, it's a significant watch group who is truly an asset for law enforcement. And, you know, the bottom line, when we ask them why they help us in this endeavor, uh, their answer is, why not? You know, we live in these communities. We want to have uh, the best uh, and safest uh, environment for our folks. So I, I would say, most well, certainly we have seen results. Uh, it's difficult to measure those. It's been a while. I hate to give you long answers, and I apologize. In the future, I'll give you shorter ones. But uh, until recently, the law enforcement have not really tracked it as, as accurately as this is human trafficking. It would get categorized maybe under prostitution or drugs or things like that. So it's, it's, it's really a lot harder for us to put the hard statistics against it. But uh, as, as Tom has put out there, you can see already that uh, we know the numbers are there. Thank you, Secretary Pate. This one looks like it's for Tom um, okay. asking about speaking at Two chamber members, um, how should I go about scheduling someone to come out and speak to us? Thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S dot Ruck, R-U-C-K, at hsi.dhs.gov. Um, email me. We'll set up a time. And, uh, you know, let's put it together. And I'll come on out and we'll do a program together. It's very important that Chamber of Commerce's 
And I deal with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce constantly. In fact, that's where I met Secretary of State and Deputy Secretary Christie uh, about a year or two ago. They presented at a U.S. Chamber event. It's very impactful and very enforceable. And like I said earlier, I bet was the first state that I'm aware of to really go after that. And that's a testament to Secretary Pate to making it work. It's a fantastic program, and we want other states to get involved with it. And how do you do that? Well, now it rolls down. So we're at the state level. Let's bring it down to the community level. And the Chamber of Commerces, if I'm saying that correctly, is the perfect place to get it done because you represent all industries in your community. And if you advertise it enough and you tell people to come, we'll make that work. We can get it work for you. And I'll be more than happy to come out and do a live presentation. Sorry about the time. Thank you, Ashley. <laughs> You're totally fine. Um, does the national hotline report to HSI? Depends on which one you call. <laughs> okay. It, plain and simple. Here's what I'm going to say. At some point in time, everybody knows everything about everybody who's reporting because it's a compiled number. You know, maybe Polaris has one phone number that you call and they track people, but then Polaris talks to uh, state police, state police talk to, uh, you know, state uh, Bureau of Investigations who talks to Homeland Security Investigations, and that's how the numbers come up and we get going. The key to remember is on reporting. It's not who you reporting report to. Is it the proper place to report? And that's why your local jurisdiction is very important. I know many jurisdictions that say we haven't even thought about it yet. Okay, so let's come out and train law enforcement. We have a person dedicated to law enforcement. They'll come out and train them. But if you can get the closer to your commu community that you can get the reporting down, the better chance you have to save those victims. Thank you, Tom. Good point there. Um, there's a question about a specific place. Um, I don't know if you can see that if you pull up the Q&A chat, um, if, we're, yeah, if we're able to answer that or not, but. Let's see. Uh, anonymous is it true that loves is that the one yep i don't have any information on that uh anonymous attendee my apologies on that but if you believe something is going on make that call or let your local police uh, uh know about it very simple very very simple thank you tom do you have what to train young people, wait staff, et cetera, on? I don't know where to start. Do you have information or a script you could share? Give me a call and we'll talk about it and we'll create a program for you that works for your audience. Or start with the email and we'll set up a time to talk. Awesome. Thank you. And this one, it sounds like it could go for um, Secretary Pate here. Um, have you made a proclamation for Human Trafficking Prevention Day slash IBAT yet. And then Tom, if you wanna jump in about the Trafficking Pre Prevention Day, feel free to do so as well. Yes, we do. Uh, as Tom mentioned earlier in January, we really put a, a full court press out. Uh, so also in uh, during the summer, we have an international day that we recognize this challenge as well. And we work to bring that spotlight to what's going on. So yes, we do. And, and I, if I could just uh, also supplement here a little bit. Uh, Tom's giving you a lot of good background information, but I just want to underscore for Iowans who are, are tuning in here, this isn't just a big city issue uh, by any means. In fact, uh, these bad actors have gotten, uh, unfortunately, he's a little smarter about it. So they're, they're now moving out to Emmitsburg or Lime Springs or you name the, the, the town uh, because they, they don't need a highway to uh, market their product as well. They, they do it through social media and the customer will come to them no matter where they're at in so many unfortunate cases. And that's why we have this broad appeal statewide. We don't, we need more than just Des Moines, Iowa or Cedar Rapids to be a part of this. And mm -hmm businesses and individuals just need to be more alert. It's like a, it's like a neighborhood watch program. When you see unusual activity, uh, alert law enforcement to it. Maybe it's not trafficking. It might be a meth lab. 
uh, but it's still not a good thing. You know, it, it, you know, we live in these communities. We should be more invested in it to protect it in that respect. So uh, that's that's really what we're asking for here. And uh, we're not asking you to be a hero. In fact, I ask you not to be a hero. I want you to let law enforcement handle those kind of procedures. Absolutely. And, you know, what we have to remember is that forced labor is about 70 or 75 percent of human trafficking. Again, everybody think it's a sex trafficking because, pardon expressions, it's sexier for TV to report about. But it's truly forced labor. And as the secretary just mentioned, please don't do anything yourself to get yourself in trouble or the traffic person in trouble. Report it out. Please report it out um, and go from there. But it's we're there. We want to make it aware. And again, I, I'm sorry for doing the secretary, but by God, you're like the best. <laughs> um, for you to take the initiative that you did when you did to create this, and now other states are realizing the importance of it. Thank you, Iowa Secretary of State, for being the leader that you are in this program. It's amazing. In Iowa, you got a great Secretary of State there. By the way, are you up for re-election? I'll run your campaign. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but I want to get the kudos to where it's really going, Tom. I appreciate the compliment, but it, it truly has been a team-building coalition uh, are working with the, the various advocate networks in the state of Iowa because uh, I, I don't claim to be the expert on human trafficking, but I do have a platform, if you will, or a bully pulpit to try and bring the message to people. But we have some really talented advocates across the state who work every single day with these victims and trying to help them move into the to a survival or be able to come out of the shadows, if you will, and have a, a life again. But that's one step. But what we're talking about today is let's just stop it. You know, let's not let it even happen. Uh, so working together, I think we can build that army. Uh, and when you talk about the various state associations, like the restaurant association, the hotel motel, the motor truckers, uh, the realtors, there's a long list of these groups. And then just mom and pop businesses on Main Street and some of our smaller towns, as well as our bigger towns. Uh, collectively, that's a pretty huge voice. And, and as I said, the 800 members we have right now represent over 300,000 employees. Just having a, a, a brief 10 or 15 minute uh, session with them to explain to them a little bit more about what trafficking is and what to look for is a huge thing. Uh, we can we can literally educate our people to a point of where the bad actors just don't stand a chance. That's it. And here's what's happening, folks. It's just like anything else. If the bad people realize that you're actively involved in it, they're going to move to another town that isn't actively involved in it. And once everybody's actively involved in it, they're going to get out of your state. It's just mm -hmm. that simple. So maybe you're a city manager. Okay. Have an open city meeting at the community hall. Invite all the, you know, the businesses. And invite the youth uh, organizations. Invite the faith organization. Invite schools. Anybody at all. Maybe you are a community business leader. Okay, invite all the businesses in your community. First of all, it's a great idea for you to get members to come and join your chamber or your organization. And second of all, it shows that you're involved in the community. There was a question there that says, what is the minimum number of, of people? I need about 60 or 70 people, okay, uh, for me to come out live. But I can easily do a program like this for 10 or 15 people. The key is we are committed to being there for you. And don't feel bad about collaborating with other entities. If you know a TV station in your area, tell them the sponsor and we'll get the whole community there. And we'll have maybe one of the hotels or motels to give their hall away for free or their convention center. Think of the power that you can have once this gets started, all because of this initiative. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Went a little long. No need to apologize. It was a great answer. And I know people will appreciate that. Um, do you have statistics of suspected trafficking in Iowa per county? That's an interesting and good question. Uh, Secretary, uh, I do not. Do you by chance? Uh, I don't have it by county. As yeah. I said a moment ago, it's extremely hard to have a hard statistic on this is trafficking. Uh, but we have seen uh, numbers from the uh, Attorney General's office talking about prosecutions and investigations, and we're talking hundreds that we have already seen in, in Iowa across the state. Uh, the news media just recently had reported on several cases here in Iowa of, of trafficking uh, as well. The uh, labor trafficking side is a little more complicated, too, because those investigations, unfortunately, take some time. 
uh, to pursue and, and for they get out there and report it. But, you know, uh, we have had several high profile cases in, in the last year or so on, a, on, the, on the labor trafficking side as well. Uh, as a business owner myself, that's a, that's a whole nother game. I mean, what Tom's talked about today on the big picture of trafficking, and granted, a lot of that was focused more maybe on the sex trafficking side, but the labor trafficking is a is a whole other beast that uh, it requires a, a separate kind of seminar almost or a workshop presentation because uh, we want to be good employers. We want to make sure we're not uh, discriminating in, as we do in interviewing or hiring process because of someone's uh, particular uh, accent or uh, a skin color. But at the same time, we want to be cognizant of the fact we don't want anyone to be taken advantage of uh, in this whole process. So uh, that, that's 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 a worthy session for those of you out there in the business world to, to maybe want to do something along those lines as a chamber of commerce, just so that folks kind of know how to handle that. You know, don't forget if you're a business and let's say it's a it's your season. And you need to get goods out the door. You have people coming in and they, you need a back room to get things done. And you can't find real employees the legal way. What may you do? Hopefully you'll have the ethics and the honor not to go out there and you're trying to find real people. But many say, okay, I can have this person for a dollar or two an hour. They can work 10 or 11 hours a night and take care of myself so I can continue to serve, not only serve my people, but make the money I need. Okay, I mean, forced labor is is huge. And that's why we have so many HSI offices around the world is because that's where it's all coming from. And we're trying to identify different areas where human trafficking is taking place. We know it's in the manufacturing and in the textile and the clothing world, but I never thought it would be in the paprika world, like I mentioned. So it's all over the place. Um, let, Melissa, real quickly. Oh, uh, S Secretary, do you want to talk about how many other states have an organization? Well, nobody has an organization similar to <laughs> IBAT because IBAT's the best, but who wants to be an IBAT out there? We've been very excited. We just presented at our national meeting uh, with our secretaries, and we're seeing more states now uh, joining us, and, and each of them are putting together a format that fits their state, but we've seen it now in uh, uh, states like Mississippi and Tennessee and West Virginia, uh, Kentucky is do, looking at it, and there are probably another four or five that are definitely ready to do something. Uh, and again, anyone who wants to pick up the mantle, I think it's a worthy cause. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, Secretary of State's office, uh, as you've alluded, your church, uh, your community group, uh, business, et cetera, are, are big pieces of this. But uh, we we have basically put it together as a template so that any of my colleagues can pick this up and, and run with it in their state. Uh, because as you kind of alluded to, if each of us do it, we're going to push the bad guys right out of business. And as, as I do my work here in Iowa, I want to make sure my colleagues in Nebraska, Minnesota, Illinois, Missouri, we're not, we're not trying to just push it on the next guy. We want everyone to be on the same level so that we truly can fight to uh, to eliminate this situation. Yes, <laughs> plain and simple. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I'm doing a, a session in about an hour for the Kentucky Restaurant Association. Uh, they've realized that it may be an issue. And they want to train their members. We're doing three uh, virtual events, and then I'm going to their national or their state convention in November. And it was a whole campaign. We did some ads in their state uh, magazine. Uh, now we're doing some virtual training, and then we'll do live training in, in November. So it can easily happen. And, and Melissa, yes, contact me. Uh, if you want to set up the event, we could do that. We can easily collaborate on it. And if I can talk to front desk for a minute, uh, the next person on chat. Um, here's the key. As I said, some jurisdictions may not know how to may not know how to handle a human trafficking report. Okay, as the secretary alluded to, it may have been uh, they may treat it as prostitution or something else. And we're trying to get them aware of what human trafficking is about, also. So all I can say is education and awareness is the key. Uh, and front desk, if you're a city council member and you want to bring something to your city council, I should have 1-800-TOM-RUCK, but I don't. I wonder if that exists. <laughs> but call me or email me and let something uh, set up. What I would love to do 
and, and Secretary and Christy, we may do this is, you know, maybe I'll set up a whole week where I'll just come out and travel the state for you on behalf of IBET and do these sessions and trainings for you at all different parts of the state. Uh, I used to travel your state when I lived in uh, Missouri and I worked for a, a company and, a, and I, I love it. Um, it's it, it's a good state and, and you got good food there and I like coming back. <laughs> Well, we appreciate that offer, and, and I just want to show folks realize we, we're pleased to have the opportunity to have the Blue Campaign uh, be a great resource, uh, and we've got a lot of good partners out there, and, and some of these advocates are, are very good uh, resources for you, too, in your communities. If you look at our website, and uh, you'll see where they're, they're there uh, in your backyard, where they can come in and do a quick presentation for you. We love having you here in, in Iowa, Tom, but, you know, you're a one man and we don't want to, we, we, we got 99 counties and about 900 cities. Uh, but I just tell you, we've got a lot of good advocates and, and, and that can speak to what's going on in your town or your county uh, that might help you as well. So keep that in mind. Absolutely. And besides, I need my airline miles, so let me come out. <laughs> Thank you very much. It looks like we have uh, one more question quick. Um, we have someone in Northwest Iowa um, in the field and they want to actively plug into battling trafficking. So they wanna know the best way to get plugged into both the state and Homeland for that. I'll answer, uh, oh, go ahead, Secretary, please. Go I ahead. just say, uh, just reach out and look at our, our IBAT website Iowa Business Against Trafficking, and there's a place there where you can you can sign on, and we'll keep you in uh, up to date on all the latest information. And it also gives you a tremendous amount of resource links, uh, including one right to Tom's uh, site. But as, as he's alluded to, we've got some good partners out there, I, and I I, I I kind of feel bad if I don't mention them all. <laughs> we'll be here all day, but they have good ideas out there of what you can do in your community, whether it's you want to help do something in a school or if you want to do something through your chamber or your main street or your festivals. And we, we have community festivals that they get involved in, in promoting uh, a campaign to combat trafficking. And a, so there's so many little things we can do, but the little things build up to where we have a real presence in this issue. So that's my plug is go to our IBAT website. And I agree with that. I mean, it's the power of coming together. And IBET has very, very good partners. And we're all in this together to combat human trafficking. And uh, it doesn't matter who you receive the training from. The key is that you get the training. And if you look at the website, it's a fantastic website. Uh, and all the resources are there. And if for some reason you can't get a resource there, 1-800-TOM-RUCK. No. <laughs> <laughs> Is there, uh, I'll let you answer this one, Secretary. I don't know if there's a directory of IBAT members or not. Yes, there is. And it's, again, it's, I keep putting you know, everything back to our website, but if they go there, they'll have that. And Ashley, will that, are we putting that up on the screen at some point or will that be, where that, can they get that? Yes. So I do have that in the webinar chat. I was actually in the process of typing back to that attendee um, that whose question we just answered previous to this one. Um, that all of that is in the chat. So everyone should be able to access um, several blue campaign resources. I have the link to their website, the resource library and the newsletter sign up. And then I also have Tom's email as well as the link to the IBAT website, the IBAT application, and then the IBAT email, um, and then the webinar feedback survey. So all of that should be in the webinar um, chat for everyone to be able to access. Great. And so if, with that information, you're going to know everything we're doing. We try our very best to uh, link in what, what our, our good partners are doing so you can be a part of it in your community. Uh, an example, we're working on another seminar, if you will, or workshop here in the near future where we'll invite people to come in and listen to a speaker. But uh, we have, uh, I, I initially learned a lot about this from Chains Interrupted out of Cedar Rapids, but they also have a Des Moines presence and they will, they do quite a bit of travel around the state as well and helping uh, community groups and, and individual uh, uh, companies learn more about things. In fact, I, I'm gonna put a plug out. Uh, we're hosting a, a live training next week here in Des Moines. Uh, we'll be sending out more information on that. So if you're signed up today, 
uh, if you get onto our website, we'll, you'll be on that list of invitees, uh, what we're doing. And uh, we're hoping that if Tom's airline points hold out, he'll be here with us uh, for that one. And you'll have a chance to meet him in person. <laughs> yeah, then $2.50 still gets you a Diet Coke. Thank you very much. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Well, I, I, I guess I'm going to help close it out for, for us uh, and say thank you, Tom, uh, very much for what you're doing. We've had a great uh, uh, working relationship here, and, and there's a lot of knowledge out there, and we have a lot of people with a lot of passion, and we just want to help give them the resources and the tools to really truly help us build this army to combat a uh, situation that is not tolerable, It's not, to, and it shouldn't be. And uh, thank you for all those who joined us today. I hope you'll spread the message to your friends and watch for our, more information. As I said, the, uh, the, we'll have the live training here next week, but we'll be doing more things like that across the state. And Ashley, thank you for putting this all together. Uh, is there any other things you want to tell us, Ashley, before we let you sign us out? Yes. So I just wanted to say thank you again um, to Tom, as well as Secretary Pate and Deputy Secretary Johnson. Um, thank you to all of you for your time, um, for sharing your knowledge and expertise and passion with us today on this crucial topic. And then thank you as well to all of the attendees as well. Um, we appreciate your time and attention. Um, it's good to see that there's a lot of people really passionate about this issue. We know that, but it's always good to also like see it. Um, you will all receive an email from me with these informational resources that I've included in the chat. I'll send those in a follow-up email as well um, and the webinar feedback survey. And then at a later time, you'll receive an additional email with the webinar recording once that's ready to go. And thank you all again. We appreciate your time, as I've said. And thanks for being interested in joining the fight against human trafficking.